iPad could not tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thursday, September... Hey, hang on one second. It's sorry, Thursday... Sorry. Oh, I'm going to do it again! It's Thursday, September 12, 2013. Welcome to another Galactic Netcast. This is the Time Traveling Robots in Space number 64. From Waterloo, Iowa, I'm Dave Nelson. Joining me as always is Glendale, California, Paul Swickard. And filling in for Miss Anessa Moyens is Miss Matt Stein. Or, excuse me, Mr. Miss, Matt Stein. Miss Universe? I'll take that. Why not? Uh, <laughs> you may know him from things like the Sci-Fi Film School here on the Galactic Netcast Network. And he's also filled in on this show uh, not that long ago, right? It was oh, about yeah. a month ago or so. Yep. I also had a short cameo on Naughty Night Nurses 9. Ah, good film. Yep. Great film. Not just not bad. like the other eight. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The ninth one, they got they it. Took, yeah, they took it in, <laughs> the ninth well, one. They took it in a different direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we should probably leave that. Yeah, let's. Yeah, let's move continue. On. Yeah, let's let's move forward with uh, the actual content of this podcast, which is we talk about time travel, robots, and space, and science fiction and science fact. We got some big science fact this week too. Uh, we run it down by uh, we do it by running down news stories from each topic, discuss our related entertainment picks, and ask and answer the question of the week for our audio subscriber. For our audio subscribers, if you'd like to see us record the show live, just follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Google+. You guys ready to rock and roll? Party. Rock and or roll. All right, let's start with this right here. Sector 1, time Time travel. travel. And one of our most favorite topics here on Tris is the thing that Paul is about to talk about. So, Paul. I know. I'm sorry. I should just preface that right away. I apologize to every Bill and Ted fan out there. Keanu Reeves tells MTV that development on the long rumored Bill and Ted 3 has entered limbo. Oh. I know. A purgatory from which there is no escape. A darkness that cannot be melded. <laughs> I see what you guys did there, AV Club. You guys are awesome. Not really. Wow. Speaking with MTV News, Josh Horowitz who has been similarly condemned to a lifetime of petitioning Reeves with prayers for a Bill and Ted sequel. By the way, okay, just a real quick side note, I hear Keanu Reeves is not a complete asshole. Really? Which which kind of, I don't know, it makes me a little bit more sad. Oh, so you you want him to be an asshole, is what you're saying, Paul. It would make me feel better (laughs) as a person. It would not... (laughs) And, you know, I, it, it, really, this is all about me. So, yeah, why, Kiana, just listen listen to my voice. I know you big fan of the show. I know that... <laughs> yeah. He listens all the time. He sends us feedback once in a while, he too. He does, you know, and I hear he's actually an okay guy. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of... Sub- wow. Sorry. I was yes, going to say, this, this story is written quite fancily. Yeah, they tried. Uh, there is a lot of subterfuge and controversial conspiracy theories. It's pretty dark out there. This is what Reeves is saying. Gazing into the abyss as though it were the grimmest of sandwiches. What? What? <laughs> I am so confused. What are they where, talking about? Where did this, you find okay. this? Mad Magazine? No, this, again, AV Club. That is uh. what is written. But, okay. I know that I have a vague idea of what they're talking about. He, like, he has a sad face, and it's pretty daunting. So if you click on that link, he looks pretty sad when he is eating his sandwich. Oh, the the, looks... the sad uh, Kiana. Uh, oh meat. yeah. So yeah, that's what they were referencing. All right. Sitting on the bench. He looks so unhappy. Oh, poor Keanu. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, Reeves confirmed that yes, they had a, had a script and it will live, but lamented there's darkness out there that's keeping it from happening. I don't know quite what that means. Darkness. It, it's that part of the story where it's looking grim. It's a dark period. Is this going to be the whole um, Ghostbusters three thing? It could. You know what? You may be right. You may be right. That's actually a fairly good comparison. But the thing yes. is, is that I get the impression that. 
I, I don't think a studio wants to pick it up. No. Or whoever owns the rights to it may not be interested in making any movie, like a movie out of it. Um, but I know with Ghostbusters specifically, there's been a lot of internal strife between a lot of different people, like Bill Murray especially, because Bill Murray kind of went off the deep end. Kind of went off the deep end. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could tell you stories, you know, <laughs> Bill and I. <laughs> Wait a second, wow. Paul. You know, you know Bill Murray? No. Oh. <laughs> Well, you live out there in Hollywood, you know. I figured you know you come in stars all the time. <laughs> well, I know that Harold Ramis and Bill Murray have had a falling out of some kind, mostly oh. because like he, that is Bill Murray. Like I, I don't know if y'all remember Groundhog Day, yeah. Yes. Harold Ramis directed that, and Bill Murray was going through a divorce at the time. And I know that he was, you know, showing up late, not remembering lines, that kind of thing. Um, and it just got kind of, it just kind of got a little heated between the two of them. And it, things apparently have not been the same since. I want you to kill all the gophers. Well, if they kill all the golfers, they'd lock me up and throw away the key. <laughs> I can't do the voice. While Reeves, we're moving on. While Reeves wouldn't or couldn't elaborate, it is perhaps worth noting that our announcement last month that Rambo was getting a TV series ugh, seemed to give Alex Winter pause on reviving his own aging franchise, and so it's possible that we have ourselves an unwritten part of a vast conspiracy along with Halliburton. Our Bill and Ted confronting the darkness is simply a part of accepting the decay that is inherent in life. Wow. As a philosopher, as a philosopher once put it, "Dust, wind, dude." Wow, so great. This story, it, it doesn't you deserve. Know what, yeah, I gotta give him at least some credit. Like, I'm glad they're. This is so much better than a lot of the fairly dry stuff that we that we kind of have to trudge through here. That's true. I'm glad but, that they're actually like doing some weird stuff. You know, it's great for reading, but it's not good for podcasting. Well, it's not good for reading out loud, you know? Sure. I, I come from the school. I'm please, a broadcast, please. I'm a broadcaster, of course. You guys know that. <laughs> so I come from a school of things that are written very simply because you don't want your fancy words in your stories because it's you don't because you want to interpret that yourself. You don't want somebody to interpret that for you, you know? Right. So you want to you want to be the one adding flair. Yeah, yeah. I want to add the flares and flourishes. All right. Sorry. Wow. Oh, why'd you stop? Stop. That's like keep going. I want, to yeah, right. I want to see him crash and burn. He hasn't crashed and burned yet. Go. Yep. Dance, monkey. <laughs> so uh, that's bummer. I I was hoping I I, I wanted I, to see a uh, uh, Bill and Ted cool. three. Well, again, the rumors had been around for so for forever, so I'm not terribly surprised by this news. It's sad, but I'm not surprised. I bet you Alex Winter really was upset. <laughs> He's like, "Come he, on, Kiana, I really, he, I need some work." Did, I think he did some. I forget what he. I forget what movie it was. It's like a. I think he did an indie movie about Napster. Did, in which he, in which don't they keep making Lost Boys movies? Is any of those? <laughs> he made like he Lost is, Boys 13 last month. I don't know if he was in it, to be honest. I forgot that he was. Yeah, he was in Lost Boys. I yes, forgot. Yeah. yeah, that's the only other thing he's done. This was, but that was before Bill and Ted. Like, he, no one knew who he was at the time. Wasn't he? Didn't he? Wasn't he on some MTV thing after after Bill and Ted? Like uh, show? I don't know. I didn't watch MTV much. Okay. All right. Oh. Matt, Matt's Googling. I love Google. The yep, the show's called The Idiot Box. Okay, I, I had a feeling. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I had a feeling it was something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Paul. Um, You're welcome. Very dark development, but we'll move on. We'll try to move on with our lives. Uh, before we start talking about robots and a very interesting story from the headline, um, we would like your feedback, please. Uh, we've got a voicemail number, which you can call, and it is 805-328-3966. Again, 805-328-3966. Or you can uh, send us an email, galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. 
And here we go with the robots. So they come. Sector 2. Robots. And uh, Matt, feel free to um, cut the story down a little bit. <laughs> Well, what are I'm you saying, David? not, so I, I, I really wanted to read through this at work, but we're in the midst of moving offices, so this is the first I've gotten to read this. Okay. So I'm a terrible podcast host this week, but no, no, don't worry it about happens. It. Don't worry, you, we, we brought you in last minute, we understand. No yeah, big... there's that, so it's all your fault. Uh, so Brain Slug Eats Tumors. <laughs> that is the headline, yes. I love that yep. headline. Yep, that's this is what I'm faced with. Uh, J. Mark Simard, a neurosurgery professor at the University of Maryland, saw a TV show a few years back where plastic surgeons using sterile maggots removed dead tissue from a patient. Uh, proverbial light bulb went on. Uh, it's going nowhere good. Here you had a natural system that recognized bad from good and good from bad. Uh, Simard said last week in a press release with the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, uh, the, the maggots removed all the bad stuff and left all the good stuff alone, and they're really small. I thought if you had something equivalent to that to remove a brain tumor, that would be an absolute home run. Am I alone in thinking that this guy, for being probably off the charts smart, speaks very poorly? I don't know. Well, he's like, dude, there's all this bad stuff and the good stuff, and the worms can tell the difference. Well, cool. Well, what kind of, you know, what age is he? Or what kind of, you know, person is he? Because he could be just this, like, 30-year-old, 35-year-old guy. He's a professor of neurosurgery. Well, yeah, so that doesn't probably mean 60. Anything. That doesn't mean anything, Paul. He could be, like, a surfer dude that's uh, <laughs> just got the job really at a young age. <laughs> not prejudice. No. So you're saying he's Doogie Hauser? Yes. Yeah, what are you saying? <laughs> Anyways, uh, now four years into development, Simmer and his team are working on an in, oh, intracranial robot prototype that resembles a mechanical fingertip with several joints, and thanks to the electrocautery tool and suction tube on its tip, can heat and destroy tumors and suction out debris. Wow. Ooh, better yet, it can be remotely controlled by a surgeon with the patient in an MRI scanner. Oh my God! That is some crazy stuff right there. Jeez. Wow! Yeah, I'm blown away by this. Yeah, I feel like we could probably just leave it at that. Yeah, because I mean that <laughs> alone is enough to talk about. Although I have been seeing uh, TV commercials during my cartoons about a robotic surgery wing in a hospital. It might be in Milwaukee, but. It is basically a team of people that all they do is perform surgery through robots. So oh. it, apparently this is a much larger thing. I've seen that, that commercial. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it's just that's how a surgery is done these days. And I believe the commercial that you're talking about is for prostate surgery. I think. I know the commercial I saw was just like this robot can peel a banana. Oh. It's like this robot can perform surgery and then it's like some lady and she's standing like this, and she's like, I do surgery through robots. <laughs> so it was very weird and caught me off guard. But you No, know, robots are everywhere. I mean, they're, they're taking over. They're taking over. That's true. No, it's very true. I mean, I mean what can you do in a daily, in a, on any given day? What do you do that doesn't involve some sort of technology at all? Uh, I Take don't know. Shower. <laughs> I shower. Think that's a trick question. Well, I mean, yeah. there's there's things. There's very old school things like showers that very minimal technology. It's just water through pipe, right? Right, but you think about it. Your cell phone, anything you do on your cell phone's technology. You drive that technology. It's like there's no shortage of ways for some sort of automated system to be integrated into your life. Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is really that's the basis for a lot of stories, right? Like, like technology gone awry. Like, yeah. um, I watched an episode of Doctor Who. Paul, um, Paul doesn't like Doctor Who, by the way. Um, and the whole thing. Communist. Was, <laughs> I don't this, deny this. 
the, the whole story was um, these computers in people's cars, and it and it basically just uh, it was controlling more than just the car. Let's just say that. So it started to control the people. Yeah, yeah, control the people. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, this is just one step further into um, what we call the um, the singularity. To my credit. I actually t- cut the story down considerably, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. Like, okay. yes, I realize that it's long. But you know what? I think I think Matt did a really good job of just basically uh, covering the guts of it. And I think you did a really good job of, of editing uh, because... You know? <laughs> well, that's all we need to know. All we need to know is this guy saw these, these um, slugs eating bad tumors one day, and a, a light bulb went off. He thought... Let's make robots into that, and he just that's the whole story. What else yeah, do we need to know? How crazy is that, that he watched some probably C-level horror movie and is now using what he saw in that movie to take cancer out of brains? That's, I mean, yeah. I, it's We're funny how the popular future, culture guys. influences like, our ideas for what like should be happening. Boy, look at look at all, all look at all the stuff from Star Trek that's become reality. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's that's the God's honest truth. It really is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, yeah, Sky Skynet in your brain. The, you know, you know what's going to happen. The, the in the middle of the surgery one day, the the um these robots, these tumor eating robots, will um become aware and they'll take over the brain of this of the of the patient right that's that would be the horror story that would be the movie maybe that's this guy's plan the whole time he's going to start taking people over oh yeah i think you're onto something oh, weird yeah he he spent his he okay so he was bullied as a child and he's <laughs> like i'm going to get you so he studied really hard and got all these degrees in neuroscience just to build a brain robot. Yes. I'm going to show you guys. <laughs> I love any, anybody that ever does that. <laughs> Mind blown. Absolutely. But that, that would be the ultimate like crazy turn of events. Mm-hmm. Is if like he's takes over someone's brain and they got him on the stand and he's like, I was planning on doing it the whole time. See, it's a perfect movie plot. Absolutely. Except he has to, aha, uh-huh, he has to save his former high school nemesis' life with this brain altering robot that he was always made fun of for. And then that's the point at which he uses it for good instead of evil. Yeah. He's faced he, with a choice. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, sees, he sees the moral dilemma and he decides to Go good. Or he realizes that he's either going to have to live with a large man named Bubba or work for the government. <laughs> yes, the government gets involved, and they make him a spy. Yep, yep. Yeah. He, he goes to Russia. All right. All right, I think we've covered this story pretty well. <laughs> um, <laughs> good job. Yeah. I, we, I think we handled it the right way. I don't think, uh, you know, getting... You. Getting caught in the minutia, the details, I don't think that was the way to go. I think we I think making things up was the better approach to that story. Absolutely. Pretty, yeah. Good work, Wait, team. If if anybody cares, the third paragraph is actually going into description as to how the process is supposed to work. Ah, detail schmeat. Yeah, no one no one cares. No one cares anymore. Details. <laughs> I just they want to know when this post. brain army is gonna take over. <laughs> All right, so the Time Traveling Robots in Space is brought to you by Audible.com, and for you, the listeners of this podcast, Audible's offering a free audiobook to kind of, you know, give you the chance to check out their service with a free 30-day trial and uh, the book that we're recommending this week. Very similar to the story that we just talked about. It's The Clockwork Man. Now, here's a brief synopsis of the story. Now, picture this. Several thousand years from now, advanced humanoids known as the Makers will implant clockwork devices into their heads. See? See the like, connection? You mean like Clockwork Orange? No. No. Oh. Uh-uh. 
<laughs> like, that's not it at all, Paul. No. <laughs> I think you completely missed the point, actually. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know what that. There's no connection. There's no connection. What are you talking about? Um, so, uh, at a cost of a certain amount of agency, which I don't even know what that word means, uh, these devices will permit us to move unhindered through time and space and to live complacent, well-regulated lives. However, when one of these devices goes awry, a clockwork man appears accidentally in the 1920s at a cricket match in a small English village. Comical yet mind-blowing hijinks ensue. And I did not read. I did not write that. That was written on. Right. And he, yeah. Hey, oh, hang on. There I, you see. Okay, hang oh, on. This, this is where you. Here. This is where you play rickety sax. Okay. Oh, I don't have that. I have this. <laughs> hijinks ensue. Mind-blowing hijinks ensue. Comical yet mind-blowing hijinks ensue. <laughs> no, 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 how about this? I like that better. <laughs> Though it's less fitting, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can put the Inception sound in anything, really, and it works. Yep, uh, yep. Download your free audiobook today. Go to audibletrial.com slash galacticnetcasts. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash galacticnetcasts, and we thank them for their support of the time traveling robots in space. Space. So I've had this. Uh, I've had my eye on this story uh, for the last couple of days, and there was an update on this. They actually published or put out on the internet the sound of the the sound that the Voyager is picking up. Let me just read the story, and you guys will get exactly what I'm talking about. So. Okay. NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft, which toured the outer solar system in 1979, has officially entered interstellar space and is now more than 19 billion kilometers from our sun, nearly 130 times farther away than our planet. An announcement today from NASA scientists confirms that the probe has entered a region of space that is outside our sun's electromagnetic influence. So... The Voyager 1 is out there just floating. It's not part of a solar system. It's it's just in deep space. Weird. Yeah. That's crazy balls. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, you might recall the many previous times that the farthest out spacecraft has been suspected of venturing out into the stars, leading many to wonder if NASA is simply crying wolf again. But an analysis of data from the machine's plasma wave sensor suggests that Voyager 1 is, in fact, reaching interstellar space, or it reached it uh, more than a year ago, in August of 2012, to be exact. Um, the unexpected finding relayed, or no, relied on the fact, I can, I can read, uh, that an energetic outburst from the sun, an I believe energetic you. outburst from the sun, He's the sun's very energetic. <laughs> hey guys! Ah, <laughs> uh, sun's bursting again. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let me let me go back to the story. Energetic outburst from the sun, known as a coronal mass ejection, passed by the probe in April, allowing scientists to calibrate their instruments and determine the density of plasma around the spacecraft. Our solar system is bathed in a constant wind of charged particles and plasma emanating from the central star. Uh, the solar wind tapers out at some far distance, many billions of miles beyond Neptune and the rocky belt where Pluto lives. But scientists have always been unsure exactly where. Models of this region of space are noticeably or notoriously tricky, and new data has been caused, has often caused researchers to question everything they knew before. Hey, we have a question. Yes, sir. From Austin Jerry. Hello, Austin. Hi. If that's your real name. Um, hey. Hang on. Uh, what TV show are you on? What TV show am I on? I thank you because you said broad, you're in broadcasts uh, and stuff. Oh, okay. 
Are you guys? He's on radio. Yeah, I'm on the radio. I'm on a radio station in Waterloo, Iowa. Which is, I mean, we all know is more or less meaningless. So, well, exactly. <laughs> if it's not bad enough to say that you're on the radio, to say you're on the radio in Waterloo, Iowa, hey, that's I... like saying you're a big deal in, like, I don't know, <laughs> Idaho. Okay. But you I don't know if you've heard, but I'm kind of a big deal. My name's Dave Nelson. <laughs> hey, wait a second, okay? I'm not just on the radio in Waterloo. I'm on the radio around the world because we are on iHeartRadio. You can stream on our website at uh, kcrr.com. So just don't, don't play so, it. So you're around the world in the same way that this show is around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You're a phony. You're a big, fat phony. Uh, all right, all right. I think, yeah, but, hey, I, Dave, well, hey, I think it's great that you're on the radio. I wish I could be on the radio, but I'm not. Yeah, I'm pretty world famous. I'm from the Internet. You know, I'm man, I, I invited you on the show tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and I, can, I gladly accept it. And I can uninvite you. I can, I could remove you from the show right now if I wanted to. Just so you know, you remove me. You remove... All my fans. Oh, yeah. Both of them. So, yeah, I was going to say, so like 10 more people might show up if you get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, that guy's gone. Let's, let's go listen. Oh, thank God. <laughs> All right, so basically the story talks about how the sun, they used the sun to figure out that the Voyager 1 was no longer in the actual solar system itself because of the charged particles and the just kind of the atmosphere, not atmosphere, but... Just the the surrounding space. That's really weird that they have to judge it in that way. You'd think they'd be able to figure it out yeah. other ways. Well, they weren't sure. I mean, they weren't sure for the longest time where the actual edge of the solar system was. You know, it was very... It was, yeah. yeah, I suppose that's you know. true. So um, I guess the next thing that Voyager will do will be turn into V'ger and come back and wreak havoc, havoc on our solar system in about 200 years. And then Captain Kirk and the Starship Enterprise will stop V'ger from wreaking havoc on our on our solar system. You guys... That's, that was my first thought. You guys both look lost. You have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> no clue. Let's, let's pretend that we do understand okay. and we'll yeah. move on. Okay, it's, yeah. it's the plot to Star Trek The Motion Picture released in 1979. It was Dude, the... I haven't seen that movie in... <laughs> I wasn't even born. Years. God, I hate you, Matt. <laughs> I, I was negative six years old. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. So. Uh, you love me. You know, one of the cool words that's in the story is Oort Cloud. O-O-R-T Cloud. Oort it's Cloud. A band of icy bodies from which many comments originate. Well, I've heard that phrase or that word before. Oort Cloud. It's uh, hypothesized to exist a distance of 50,000 times that of Earth and the Sun. Wow. You know, when you, start think, when you start talking about and thinking about how big space is, you just become very, very small. You just like, you know, it's just so, it's so big to even just wrap your head around. Uh-huh. That's true. You know, it's space. Very That's true. why they call it space is because there's a lot of it. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, let's move on from space and to our picks. But before we do, let's talk about our second sponsor of the show, which is Stitcher.com, the Stitcher Smart Radio, which you can listen to this very show on and the other Galactic Netcast shows and other podcasts as well. It's a really cool app that you can uh, download onto your phone, any any smart device. You can actually listen to Stitcher on your um on your browser as well, and it's free. That's the best part. So what you do is you go to stitcher.com slash galactic netcasts and then enter the promo code galactic netcasts, all right? And that will show Stitcher that we're sending people their way. You can get it through your app store, but we would prefer that you go to stitcher.com slash galactic netcasts and enter that promo code galactic netcasts. And uh, that way, uh, you know, get a little credit, a little little effort, you know, something for the effort. Um, and how Stitcher works is you can stream your audio. Instead of downloading stuff onto your phone, which you can also do with Stitcher, but as long as you have an internet, uh, you know, a stable, good internet connection, you might as well just stream the audio, right? So it's true. Um, 
you, you won't be wasting space. Maybe you picked up a, a cheap, you know, smartphone with very limited space, you know. You get so many apps on your phone, you have no more space left for anything else. You got your music, you got your apps, but no room for podcasts, you know. Uh, you get the Stitcher app and you just stream them and you're good to go. Uh, so again, stitcher.com slash galactic netcasts and enter that promo code galactic netcasts. All right, you guys ready for your picks? Absolutely. Yep. All right, Paul, looks like you're first. Oh, goody. My pick this week is a video game. I know everybody out there is shocked. This is my. It, this is how this goes. This is my eternal quest to actually get Dave to actually play something, <laughs> which is difficult. And you, don't, so, you don't want me... Okay, this is the extent of my video game playing. I have uh -huh. a bowling game on my phone. You can call that a game if you want, but that's for, you know... Old people. <laughs> yeah. I have that and the and, and uh, solitaire. Right. <laughs> yeah, the solitaire. Yeah. Here, Dave, have a glowing pen. Okay. Oh. Ooh. Shiny lights. <laughs> okay, continue with your story. FTL <laughs> is the video game of choice this week, and it is a top-down. Uh, real-time strategy indie game created by a company called Subset Games. So, here's the deal. You are the commander of a starship. Oh, it is cool. Game. And basically, you have this small crew in the beginning, and you're, uh, the story, there's not much of a story, but you're holding critical information that is to be delivered to the Allied fleet several sectors away while you're being pursued by a very large rebel fleet. That's the, that's the story behind this whole thing. So you're always having to run away. That's the first thing that it's basically you have to keep in mind. So what happens is that you get to tell this crew where they need to go and what they need to do, and you have each section of the ship, and I'll get, remember, this is all top-down, you have usually one guy in engineering if you want. You have one guy in weapons. You have one guy in shields. You have one guy in uh, actually piloting the ship. And basically you only have a given amount of power for each single area. So if, that, so if what I'm saying is making sense, you can have a limited number. Of, you have limited power to go to like something like shields or weapons or something like that. So if something goes wrong which things can go wrong in this game real quick, is that you actually have to, like, balance everything out. You actually have to, like, figure stuff out. Like, at the same time, and this happens, this happens all the time, basically, all at once, a fire breaks out on a ship because it's some, when, uh, somebody fired a missile at you, and it hit, and you have to put out the fire, and there's intruders on the ship, and they just took out your shields. So Great. your job is to sort of manage your crew. Like, try to say, uh, okay, you kill those guys, you put out the fire, and you try to repair the shields, kind of a thing. Oh, wow. It, it gets crazy, crazy complicated. Very it sounds quickly. really... It's, and you know what? It's not even that... It's not even... Comp I shouldn't say complicated. It's just... It's hectic. It gets so like, ah! Like, oh my god, everything is happening at once. So what, what, what platform is this on? This is on uh, PC. Okay. Yeah, and it's and it's cheap. I think it's like, I mean, if you wait for a sale, it's like five bucks. I think I got it on one super duper cheap sale for like two fifty. Okay. That's when I got it too. Oh, you guys have both. But, uh, yeah, I have the same too. Cool. But uh, yeah, it gets it gets crazy, crazy weird. Like, not even weird. It's just like. You, it's this constant battle of you trying to survive and trying to figure out what needs to be upgraded first. Like, do you need to upgrade your weapons first? Do you need to upgrade your shields first, or what? What? What's your priority, basically? Well, kind it's, of thing. well it's more realistic than than a lot of games because that's what you would have to do if you were a starship captain. You would have to manage. Of course, you'd have people that would be doing those things for you, but still, as the captain, you'd have to tell people. You know, you, you, let's work on this first, this second, this third, or, you know, these people over here, or these people over there, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. It's just so, it, it again, I can't emphasize enough that it's just hectic. It's just, it just gets really crazy really quickly. And it's also a lot of fun. 
Cool. I might have so, to check it out. I know. This I'm may sorry. be the tipping point for me. I. It sounds interesting. We'll see. I I, I don't want to get my hopes up. Basically, is what that boils down <laughs> don't, to. Don't 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 hold your breath. But I'm I'm thinking about it. Okay. All right. FTL. Faster FTL, than light. FTL. Faster than light. Yep. That is what it stands for. How does the ship? Uh, what in what fashion does it go faster than light? What does it use to go faster than light? Oh, I don't know. Stuff it used this little 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 uh, icon. <laughs> Doesn't really go into the science of it. No, not at all. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, cool FTLgame.com. Cool. We'll uh, put a link uh, in the show notes, obviously, and we'll put a link up in the the picks page on the store at galacticnetcasts.com. All right. Mine's a little bit different. Mine's a uh, documentary. It's called. But it's game-related in some way. Uh, it's called Man on a Mission, Richard Garriott's Road to the Stars. Are you guys familiar with Richard Garriott? Nope. No. You both said no? That's correct. Okay. Correct. He is, you should know him, because he was one of the very first game developers. Like, way back when. Like, in the late 70s, early 80s. And I wish I could tell you the games that he that he came up with. Let me do a quick... Uh, Google search. So I know if I told you the names, you might know the games. Names, okay. games. Names are the games. Stays mainly on the planes. There we what? go. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> sure, Paul. Whatever, man. Yeah. Sure. It rhymes. It works. It's been a long week, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's a... Here, I'll put the link in our little chat here. So you guys can look at it as well. Um, but games like uh, Acklebeth, World of Doom, um, Ultima. Oh, see. really? Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. All, the, all the Ultima games. Holy crap. Yeah. crap. Um, City of Heroes, City of Villains. Yeah. So, so an MMO, MMO dude. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was he was the he was on the forefront of MMOs way back when. I mean, way I mean, 1970. He he tells the story in the documentary about how he sold his first game. Like, he would go go into these computer stores with this game that he wrote, and they're like, "This is way better than the stuff that the actually comp the, the companies are like coming out with. So you should <laughs> sell it here." So basically, what he did was he. He went to the computer store and made a bunch of copies of his game, and like he, I think he spent like two hundred dollars on plastic bags for the games. And that I, was his, I had no idea about this. That was his initial investment, and he became a billionaire from there. That's so, kind of awesome. Yeah, and this documentary is crazy good. It's like, okay, so he his father was an astronaut. His father um, spent time in space aboard. Skylab, which was our first like space station in orbit, uh -huh. Skylab, um, it was back in the 1970s. And he grew up with his dad being an astronaut. He wanted to go into space as well. But number one, his vision was crap. So he couldn't actually uh, join any kind of, like, he couldn't join NASA. His vision was terrible. So I hate, what do I you. Hate <laughs> I'm just saying, but, like, I, I can relate to that personally. Like, there's a lot of stuff that you might want to do, but you can't because of no fault of your own, like some physical thing. Yeah, here, here's the thing, though. He, um, he made, made all this money on his game development. He was one of the first people in the world to get LASIK surgery. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and then... He really didn't like that. Good for him. No, yeah. And then, once he got enough money... Uh, Thirty or twenty million dollars at first. Uh, he started this company called Space Adventures, and um, th at first they went to NASA to see if they could, if there was enough money that they could spend. Or Space Adventures was basically sending civilians into space, giving civilians the opportunity to experience space travel. So they went uh -huh. to NASA first. NASA turned them down point blank. They're like, no right. way. Uh, they went to the Russians, asked them the same question. They said no, but the only reason we're saying no is because it would cost us money to figure out how much it would cost us. Um, the actual cost expenditures, how much. Um, so what they did was they came back and they did that 
for them. They figured out how much it would cost for them. They used their own money to figure out how much the Space Adventures Company figured out how much uh, the Russians would need or to charge uh, civilians. So the cost was $20 million. So he was, re he was set to be the very first civilian to go into space. And then the bubble burst on the Internet, and he lost like a bunch of money. So he had, to, uh, yeah, he had yeah. to sell his ticket to somebody else, but eventually he made enough money back that he was able to actually buy his way into space, and they followed him through all of his training. Like, he went to Russia. Um, Star City is the famous Russian um, place where they train astronauts. So he had, to, he had to go through all the training. He had to learn Russian because in, in, <laughs> in the Soyuz capsule, everything's in Russian, right? And the... The controllers are speaking Russian. The astronauts are speaking Russian. So he had to learn a little bit of Rush, Russian to get by. And then they went through all the training, you know, the spinny thing that you always see them go in, uh, the astronauts, the centrifuge deal. Uh -huh. um, so all the training, they showed how they, they, molded, they molded his seat on the Soyuz capsule. They actually have to take a mold because it's, it's so important that when the... Soyuz capsule uh, lands, right? You you want a secure seat, right? You don't want to move around at all. You got to have a tight seat. So they show how they mold the seat, and they show his father is kind of along along with him during the whole thing, and it's really kind of a neat story between because he ended up being the first. They ended up being the first father son, father and sons to go into space. That had never That's happened cool. before. Yeah. But here's the here's the a really cool part of this movie is there's never been a movie shot in space, and this this was a oh, movie yeah, shot in true. space. Yeah, because you always see like really crappy video, right? Like uh, broadcasting from sure. the International Space Station cool. or the shuttle. And even Apollo 13, if y'all remember that movie, that wasn't shot in space. They no. what they did is they took a plane, yeah. and they start, and they got what took it up very very high, and then. Put it into a steep dive, and basically mm -hmm. that simulates weightlessness, and that's why they were floating around. The vomit comet. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was really cool to see they they didn't show the actual launch, but once they got into orbit, they turned the camera on, and it was all first person perspective. You know, it was really <laughs> cool to see uh, what life was like inside the Soyuz capsule. And you learn a lot of science too. You learn how the whole launching sure, system sure. works. I didn't know that there was like three parts to the Soyuz capsule. There's like a, a habitable place where they can hang out and stuff. Then there's the actual capsule itself. Um, and then they get to this space station eventually, and he t he tours through the space station. You see every single part of the space station. Um, they show the toilet. They explain how the toilet works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at the very end, you have to watch to the very end because he actually he's in front of this audience explaining like a metaphor of how a toilet in space works. And gravity is not your friend when it comes to doing number two uh, in no, space. I did not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the, one of the coolest parts was they had the cameras rolling with the Soyuz going back into orbit or going back into the atmosphere and landing the whole way down. Like you could see the fire come at like the window, the fire from the the spacecraft going through the atmosphere, and then they had the camera rolling till the very end until it landed on the ground, and everything just chaos inside, just everything falling down. It was really cool to watch. So, so yeah, check it out. It's really amazing, cool documentary. It's called Man on a Mission: Richard Garriott's Road to the Stars. I I wish I was him. Because he has a lot of money, and he's been to space. <laughs> <laughs> so he's rich, and he's been to space. And, that's, yeah. and that makes you want to... <laughs> that makes you want to be him, huh? That's all it takes? Yep, money. That's all it takes, yep. <laughs> um, what's his face from Google makes an appearance in this movie? Um, Sergey Brin was in this movie. Oh, yeah. Because he also bought a ticket to go into space. I don't know if he has. I don't, I don't think he has, but he bought a ticket, at least. All right, that's my pick. Matt, you're up. Uh, I picked Space Quest 1, The Sarian Encounter. It is a video game that... When did this come out? 
October of 1986. So, Dave, I was born for this one. Wow. So you should be happy with that. Barely born. <laughs> uh, it originally came out on DOS and for the Apple II. Wow. <laughs> uh, Holy crap. I don't remember at what age I first played this, but it was probably one of the first games I ever played. Uh, it's... <sighs> Paul, have you ever played this by chance? I have not played it. I know it. Okay. I don't know exactly how to describe its play style, <clears throat> but essentially you use your keyboard's arrow keys to walk around, and when you get up to a door and you want to open it, you have to type open door. So what you're describing is a like a, a quest or a, a, a an old school adventure like. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Old they, they, game. They, a text adventure, basically. Text adventure. Yes. They turned into point-and-click adventures, which are, oddly enough, like my favorite type of game to play ever. <laughs> um, but it's you, you play as a janitor named uh, Roger Wilco. <laughs> and I was reading uh, the, the Wikipedia page, and apparently, and I didn't know this, they never named him Roger Wilco. It was the default name when you started a game and they asked you to name your own character. So, so people just started calling him Roger Wilco, and that's how he got his name. Funny. <laughs> yeah. So you start off on this, this, this ship. Like, All right, right, sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you start on the ship, and there's, like, alarms going off, and you find out that you're being attacked by the Sarians, and you get off the ship, and you crash on a planet, and through adventuring and, and puzzles and stuff, you find your way back onto the Sarian ship and kind of kill them all. You blow the whole thing up. But where Dave will probably think it's cool is a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that happens is like very uh, Star Wars and Star Trek-esque. Like you go to uh, essentially the Star Wars cantina at one point and the band <laughs> is playing the cantina song wow. while you're like sitting in there. How'd they, how they manage that? How'd they get the licensing for that? Well, it's... It's like a really bad MIDI knockoff that there's probably like two notes that are different. That was just okay. enough for them to get away from or get away with it. Yeah. Um. But there was what the hell happens later? I think when you when you blow up the ship at the end of the game, you have to like drop this bomb from like just the right spot, and it was supposed <laughs> to signify the at the end of whatever Star Wars movie when Luke Skywalker shoots like just perfectly. A lot of stuff like that. So it sounds like a very much sounds like a Star Wars ripoff. Yeah, and it was it was done so on purpose. Like it's supposed to be the comedic version of Star Trek and Star Wars. Okay. Uh, there's six six total games. The seventh one never got made. Uh, but the two guys that made this game recently funded successfully funded through Kickstarter a new game called Space Venture. Which is oh yeah, I heard it, about that. Yeah, it, it essentially, from what I understand, will be Space Quest Seven, but since uh, Sierra Online, whoever bought them, still owns the rights to the name Space Quest and Roger Wilco, yeah. they had to give it a different name and everything like that. Okay, that's my pick. No, it's that's a good, a good one. Pick. I wonder if there's an em is there an emulator out there for this? Can, can you, you can actually download it through uh, GOG.com, Good Old Games. Okay. You can get like one through three for ten bucks, and then four through six for another ten bucks. Okay. Cool. I yes. love how I love how these old games still live on after years and years and years. Oh, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I still go back and play them like. Uh, there's uh, Tex Murphy, or some like noir futuristic crime type drama games. Uh, I'm trying to think like a TV show, like a futuristic TV show meets a nowadays crime drama made into a video game. Huh. And hey, it was. What? I was gonna say this. Did you read the Wikipedia page all the way down to the bottom? There was a comic released. In 1992, The Adventures of Roger Wilco. No, I did not. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. No, I no, no, that. that's fine. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. See? I'm sorry. <laughs> I goofed you up. I'm going to hunt down that comic, though. 
<laughs> no, I remember playing games like this. Like I'm totally I'm I'm not a total like non video game person. I remember playing I just these make early. Feel yeah. <laughs> I remember playing these early, early like text based games. Like sure, um, sure. you know, um what was the Wagon Trail. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail, Oregon Trail yeah. yeah. I, I bought Oregon Trail. Actually. Yeah. Awesome. Well there's it's the same concept, but it's called Oregon Trail, not Oregon Trail. Oregon. And it's like a zombie apocalypse setting and you're driving across the country. Oh, that is awesome. It was on Steam for a Steam sale for like a dollar twenty five. It's cool. Yeah. Oregon Trail. That's yep. sweet. And the funny thing is you pick someone up right away at the start of the game, and like instantly they die of dysentery. <laughs> yeah, that's an homage to the Oregon Trail. That's yep. All right, cool. Well, thanks for the picks, guys. Uh, we'll put as many of these up on the picks page as possible at galacticnetcast.com. That's another way that you can support the network by uh, purchasing things through us, through Amazon. It's pretty cool. All right, um, before we get out of here, we have to ask and answer the question of the week. And, Paul, you yes, prepped yes, the show, so you have to ask the question. Okay, okay I can I ask can this. this. All right, this is a would you rather. Okay, would I love it. It's not fun. <laughs> would you rather be on the island of Dr. Moreau, the spaceship in War of the Worlds, or the futuristic society in the time machine? Oh, God, this is a tough one. Because they all don't, they're not all great. No, they're, none of them are very good. <laughs> like, for very different reasons. I well, feel like I have an advantage because I know nothing about any of these. Okay, do you want to do a quick synopsis of all three of these, Paul? Uh, Dr. Moreau does these horrible experiments on essentially trying to create hybrids of humans and other types of animals. Okay. Uh, Spaceship and War of the Worlds, they essentially turn people into mulch and, like, fertilizer. Okay. Uh, and uh, the futuristic science of time machines is, like, you have two warring factions of people. Uh, I forget the name. There's the underground people, and then there's the above-ground people. Right, that's how, that's how I remember. But they've been, like, they've been, they hate each other, and there's constant warring going on, and... He's kind of like the person who's traveling is kind of caught in the middle. None of these places are very safe. <laughs> yeah, my I'm I'm gonna go with uh, the least bad of these, and I think it's War of the World or not War of the Worlds, Time Machine, just because. Time Machine, you might have a shot. Maybe yeah. a very slim one. <laughs> yeah, because Doctor Moreau is gonna get you sooner or later, right? And then War of well, the, the Worlds is not very big. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I guess you could hide for a while, but probably. You're gonna get found. Um, spaceship, you're screwed on War of the World. So I'm, I'm gonna yeah, say yeah. time machine. I'm gonna say whichever one I die the quickest at, because I feel like you're gonna die anyways. So yeah, that was kind of where I was thinking. That's where my head is at too. It's yeah. like, okay, which of these things will allow you to like suffer the least? And if you're talking about that with any sort of if you're talking about that, then most likely, I would say actually the spaceship in more of the worlds because it's pretty much just you're in, you go into a grinder and that's it. Yep. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> See, I think you'd have a fighting chance in the time machine in the future. Maybe. You're gonna I'm die. Not, but even, okay, consider something else. Even if you survived, I'm not sure that's the place you want to live. Right. Eh, I'm gonna take my chances. <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's a terrible question, but I mean, I know. Not, I mean, not thought provoking. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's a good question, but it's a ter. I mean, it's there's no good answer. I like that though. Yeah. All right. That's good job, sure. Paul. Thank you very much. Awesome show, everybody. Thanks for filling in, Matt. You no made a great Anessa. You didn't, I feel like I might be cuter though. You didn't sit back in your chair far enough though. <laughs> oh. Here, it's just, how's this? <laughs> perfect. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, perfect. <sighs> yeah, you got a little bit too much. Uh, okay, never mind. We won't. We won't continue there. Jump, Jump in the trunk. Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
805-328-3966 is the voicemail number. Let us know what you thought of this, the subjects that we talked about tonight. Email galacticnetcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Plus. Just search Galactic Netcasts. We're also on iTunes. Subscribe to us there or Stitcher Smart Radio. Um, all right. What we do on this show is final thoughts. Paul always goes last. So, Matt, you have to give us a final thought, and then Paul will, and then we'll end the show. Oh, man. Um... I know. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I forgot about the whole final thought thing. So yeah, didn't we do I this? I found that it doesn't need to be profound. <laughs> Coming from a guy that has the same final thought every week. <laughs> what you, exactly? What is the problem? Uh, in honor of our discussion of Bill and Ted, I would like to use a thought that uh, Bill S. Preston Esquire did recite. Every rose has its thorn. <laughs> And I don't remember the next line of that song, okay. but he says that. Just and like every, just like every uh, cowboy sings a sings sad. A sad. Yep. <laughs> See, but yes. Now you're gonna really love Paul's final thought because that's also related to Bill and Ted's. You know what? I don't care if it's unoriginal, and I don't care if you give me shit about it every week. Well, 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 well. Now we're now we're rated R. Oh, oh we. Oh. oh. You we've, know, given you know, on, we've given up on the non swearing thing. You know what I should have done? I should have just stole Paul's because now I know what it is. <laughs> Be excellent to each other. Yep. All right, there we go. All right, guys. Thanks uh, Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to Dad, you next time. Dad, I didn't get a final thought from you. Oh, oh I, don't, I don't do a final thought. You do what? now. I'm the That's horse shit. Called out. I'm, the, I'm the puppet master. I tell yeah, you, right? you guys what to do. This is horse crap. I told you 27 times I didn't want salmon. What? <laughs> I don't know what that means. It's from Step Brothers. Okay, all right. My final thought is go out and live life like you're being chased by a bunch of alien invaders. What? I don't know. Just let mean? it go. Just yeah. act like it didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nothing to see here. All right. <laughs> Move along. We'll talk to you guys next time. <laughs>